Listeners, I am joined uh, today by legends. I will have to say legends in the hemophilia community, Dana Kuhn and Kathy McKay. Thank you so much for joining me here on Bloodstream. I feel like I won the prize that I get to be the one talking to the both of you. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Yes, thank you for giving us a chance to talk about yes. advocacy. Thank you. Great to be oh, here. Absolutely. Um, Kathy, I'm going to start with you because... Um, Selfishly, you wrote us an email. We we badger our listeners to send us emails about topics that we should talk about. And you did it <laughs> as a loyal listener. You were like, this is important. Um, so I, I will turn it over to you first. Um, tell me a little bit about your advocacy history here in the hemophilia community, how you got involved, your husband, Dave. Um, tell me a little bit and our listeners about you. Sure. Um, I, there's an um. So I will tell you up front that I was not involved in the hemophilia community <clears throat> while my husband was alive. We were living in New Hampshire. His name was Dave, wonderful guy, special education teacher. I, I met him and fell in love with him shortly after he showed up on my doorstep on Halloween dressed as Dracula. I didn't understand the uh, humor <laughs> there, but um, I soon learned. And... <laughs> Long story short, we ended up um, getting married, but before then, he actually was diagnosed with HIV and hepatitis C. Now, we didn't know the history of what had happened, and we were not connected to any communities along the way, and therefore, I just didn't know. I didn't know about COT's existence. I wish I did. I really, Dave and I both could have used the um, support along the way, emotional support that COT had to offer. And so I, you know, he died in June of 1997. And two weeks after he died, I received a call from John Ryder, who was the then social worker for the Committee of 10,000. And it was during their, um, uh, the Ricky Ray Bill days, the he Ricky Ray Hemophilia Relief Fund Act, where we were caught was, uh, was, had drafted, helped draft a bill at, to, Dana, correct me if I'm getting any facts wrong here, but to um, to provide a payment to hemophiliacs and their next of kin who contracted HIV from, the, from, uh, from blood products. So I didn't, John quickly alerted me to the fact, to, to the history and of COT. I, you know, I asked who's, what is COT and who is Ricky Ray? And I became educated very quickly. And I realized that so much had come before me that I was benefiting from, for example, the class action lawsuit, which mm. Cot was involved in, um, mm. the Ricky Ray bill, which had been going on behind the scenes, um, Dana's work with Cot and other uh, folks that he will speak to speak about, I'm sure, who were involved in sort of the investigative part of, of the blood supply crisis. And I realized this, so I realized this just didn't happen out of thin air, you know, that I now being a part of this community had an obligation to do at least my part, um, no matter how small in comparison to, you know, what I call these giants that <laughs> came before me. Um, so that's when I, you know, just started, um, started going to Washington several times a year until Ricky Ray, Ray was passed, the Ricky Ray bill was passed and funded. Along the way, I took pictures because I was a, a newspaper photographer. So I just felt instinct, instinctively at first, I began taking photographs just to document this history. And, um, and it really became my mission in life to keep this history alive and to make sure that it is preserved and that we don't forget about it because I've noticed back then and even today, so few people know about what happened with the blood supply. And again, it's all about, mm -hmm. it may seem cliche at this point, but it's really all about making sure such a, um, such a tragedy does not occur again. So it's all about preservation and education. 
Thank you, Kathy. Before we move on, um, Dana, I had the opportunity last year to um, interview several of your advocacy peers from back in the day. And there was one name that just was said all over and it was yours. And so when I finally met you last year, I felt like I was meeting a celebrity <laughs> um, because, you know, I'm an idiot like that. Um, so I'm so excited to get an opportunity to speak with you now. Um, and I wondered if you could share with our listeners a little bit about the evolution of COT. Um, what was its genesis? Um, what was it set up for? And how it has um, kind of evolved throughout the years? Sure. And first, I want to say, um, you know, how glad I am to have an opportunity to kind of share with Kathy. And Kathy is absolutely superb. Um, she's a star. And the, <laughs> and the reason she's a star is because... You know, she captured what was happening on film. And it was, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. If we didn't have the pictures that she took to go along with the stories, you would really, it wouldn't make the impact that it makes today. And it, it's great to kind of have an opportunity to see all the pictures that she put together during the times that I call them the tumultuous years. Of uh, really the the tumultuous years from 1992 to about probably about 1995 96, mm -hmm. and um, but her pictures, you know, they you look at them and you just tears well up in my eyes when I look at them and and think about where we were at those times and were we ever going to accomplish what we did, um, mm -hmm. and and it did it happened it all happened, but. That's not the question you asked me. So the question you asked me is, how did uh, COT come along? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the um, oh, a lot of the founders and a lot of the people who are part of COT are gone, and it 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 really breaks my heart. Um, fine people that really were involved in COT, and uh, COT was a real um, energizer to what was taking place. They marched to a, um, a, a beat of a different drum or a different beat of a different drum. You know, they were great hmm. at uh, being able to advocate. And, you know, I came along in, uh, it was probably, I'm trying to think about it, it was about 1993. Um, prior to that, I was very involved with NHF. And NHF was, uh, at that time, teetottering about whether or not they wanted to let people associate hemophilia and AIDS. And mm -hmm. um, it was it was very silent, and they kept silent, mm -hmm. and they encouraged people to be silent because of the discrimination that they uh, saw happen to not only Ryan uh, White, but Ricky Ray and their family. And so everybody was very silent about all of this. And I, I remember, um, you know, I think what was a catalyst of things is at that point, no one was coming out and who had hemophilia and families were coming out and telling anybody that they were infected with HIV. There were some that were going through litigation um, and, um, but those were the really the only ones that, uh, were kind of, um, I guess, public, but that was even mm -hmm. sheltered too because of the the lawsuits that were taking place, and these are more private mm -hmm. lawsuits. Um, and I know that, um, you know, I came out um, in 1992 of September, and um, on National Public Radio, um, Alex um, Chadwick, who did Morning Edition. Uh, I sent him a lot of information that I had gathered from the Trail of AIDS and the Cumi AIDS and the hemophilia community, about a 250-page document. And, um, and that was a document that really was a catalyst for so many things that took place. Uh, lawsuits, um, um, the Institute of Medicine uh, study, and then eventually the class action suit. But where, where I came in contact with... Um, with COT was um, 
I'd have to say, first of all, through um, Michael Rosenberg and the Peer Association, and um, and they were they were really, um, uh, you know, I would call them activists, <laughs> and they really and Michael was wonderful at, at least starting the groundwork of finding uh, documents that. Uh, revealed what the government knew and what pharmaceutical companies knew uh, when and um, at, you know, what dates and started that. And then he became sick. But anyway, in 1992, when I was um, um, on national public radio, um, I was introduced as Mr. X. And um, and by the end, and then uh, there was also Jonathan Wadley was on that broadcast, but he would not reveal his name and the reason he didn't reveal his name is because he had a job and he didn't and he was trying to again afraid of the discrimination and yeah. uh, that could happen and how he could lose his job well i was working in the hospital at that time and i had gotten a job came through the hell that i came through and um and it was at the point of of um in that inter- interview that I revealed all the documents that I had and, and Alex Chadwick was kept on asking questions. And finally he was coming to the end of the interview and he said, he says, are you willing to tell us your name, Mr. X? And I said, yes, it's Dana Kuhn. And I'll tell you, the phone started ringing off the hook and a Jeff called <sighs> me, people were calling me and they were just saying, why did you do that? Why did you associate hemophilia and AIDS? Why? You know, we're, you know, they, no one wanted to really do that. And I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. I lost a lot. I have everything to gain now. And that's what I did. And that's, that's what catapulted me into uh, doing what I was supposed to do is find out why these, there were unnecessary deaths in this community, including my wife's death. And when I came out of um, being silent and being silent no more, that's when I um, learned about um, the Committee of 10,000. And the first person that I had met were Jonathan and Corey Dubin and and Tom Fahey. Um, I was invited for some reason. They, They had learned about me and I went uh, up to Boston area. They had a retreat and they invited me to come to it. And I brought my documents and everything. And that's where I met them and just bonded with them and realized that, you know, we've got to do something to together to um, bring an end to this. First of all, find a way to bring some justice to what happened and then look for a preventative way for this never to happen again. And that's mm-hmm. where I met, um, Jonathan and Corey and, um, uh, you know, I, I, and, and Tom Fahey and, and just, um, just wonderful people who, you know, this world misses and we miss every day. So mm-hmm. that's how Cot real, that I got involved with Cot. And then they had, uh, they also had the Haas brothers. Uh, there was, um, Tim and Greg and their dad, um, while they were on Cot, their dad was still, a board member of the National Hemophilia Foundation. And they were on the COT board. It was really, uh, you know, kind of very interesting, the dynamics that were going on at that time. Um, wow. And then they also met um, Matt and, and Leo Murphy, who were all just great advocates. So that's what how I came to know COT and then worked with COT constantly as their, I guess you would call, they called me their legislative um, advocate or director of advocacy. And that's when I started to go to the Hill probably every other week. Dana, that's, that's fantastic uh, backstory. And I, I was really taken by um, how you put it that the you know, kind of the word on the street was silence, you know, and that was really, you know, filtered down from the top um, out of fear. Um, There's some understanding, I guess, about about that, about, um, you know, being targeted in a certain way. Um, But I I can't help think, you know, here today, um, 
I, I can't help think that it's almost the same. You know, we don't we don't talk about it very much in the hemophilia community. Um, and that's why we're really here today um, about the work that COT has continued to do and some of the work that you all are continuing to do. Um, so, Kathy and Dana, tell me a little bit about um, what COT has been doing um, the last several decades leading up to this moment and what you all um, what you all are doing in order to preserve the history and to preserve some of these documents that are so crucial um, to that time. Yeah, and I um, I didn't, you know, I left COT because I ended up starting uh, Patient Services Incorporated, PSI. I had to, had to find the time to leave, but I did not leave COT basically until after uh, we got the Ricky Ray funding, and, and that came in 1998. Um, hmm. So we were able to uh, secure that, but all along that, um, it was very interesting that COT um, had two branches that it went. One was legislative with the government, and that ended up going through IOM and the Academy of Sciences, which then led to um, the report. And then also, it, they were going the class action suit direction, and that happened September 30, 1993 where the mm -hmm. class action uh, um, suit was certified in Chicago. And so we, we had two tracks that were going, legislative and lawsuit. And Corey kind of, um, Jonathan kind of led the way for going um, through the lawsuit. Um, and then Corey and I kind of led the way going the direction of legislative um, action. And then Corey flipped back and forth between legislative and and um and the the lawsuit and he just was right in the middle of all those things and it was really good that um you know we had these opportunities to work and i didn't get too much involved with the class action lawsuit because i was spending all my time in the legislature that's what i knew how to do best that was my uh that was my bailiwick i can do that well and um jonathan was very well at doing very well at the, at the class action suit and working with the lawyers there. So during those during those years, we that those were the directions we were going. And also, it was interesting. I don't think people really knew this, but um, it was around. I'm trying to think of the date. I have my um, I have my documents here someplace here, um, but. It was around 19, I think it was someplace around 1996, somewhere around there, um, that, and I'll look it up and we could probably get more details on it. But anyway, um, people were dissatisfied with NHF and saying it was more for um, the, the the social workers, the doctors, the nurses, not so much for the families. And so mm -hmm. um, I know Jan Hamilton and, uh, and many others all got together and said, let's form a um, organization that will be for the community, for the families, mm -hmm. for the patients, for, you know, the, the, you know, the people who are directly involved with hemophilia. So right. they started, or uh, we met together in D.C. I remember, we, I think it was one of, one of the restaurants in Georgetown we met at, and everybody got together. Corey was there, and, and Jonathan was there, and, and there were other key people that were there. And Cot kind of led the thing in the whole details of putting together what became called the Hemophilia Federation of America. And so um, people don't know that probably myself and Corey and Jonathan were kind of some of the early helping founder, founders of, um, you know, Hemophilia Federation of America. But again, mm -hmm. we didn't make a big thing of it. I spent more of my time, again, doing advocacy. But I was bringing that perspective into as they were developing around the table, kind of like a round table dinner, you know, what right. are, what is this hemophilia federation of America going to do? So Cot was mm -hmm. very instrumental in starting 
um, mm. Hemophilia Federation of America. That's fantastic. And Kathy, what is uh, what is some of the work that you all are doing now to really preserve that legacy, to preserve the history um, of the blood supply and uh, some of the HIV crisis? As I mentioned, I have been more on the periphery of cotton. I'm actually a board member now, I should say. I was just elected a board member. so You should say. <laughs> yes. I know. I forget these things. <laughs> So I am a current board member, and um, but I do know that being on the periphery before that, that COT has been um, acting as a watchdog with new treatments and just kind of monitoring uh, safety and efficacy and raising any questions that may arise uh, concerning either of those. But more recently, with this quest to find this permanent home, that's really currently mm -hmm. our priority. Uh, be again, because this history has to go somewhere, again, for preservation mm -hmm. purposes, for educational purposes. And, you know, it's it's not <laughs> fewer and few, pe fewer people are around that can speak to this. And we really want to make sure that this is safe and secure. Uh, we don't want to forget history. We don't want to forget other tragic, you know, other medical tragedies throughout history, terrible things have always happened. And we want to make sure we always want to make sure we learn from our past mistakes. And so because this history needs a home, this is where we are putting 100% of our effort right now. And so right now, UCSF, uh, once they agree to take these documents, we have shipped all of our documents to the library. They are there now. They're in mm. 50 banker boxes. Um, they do include oh. some some personal documents, too. And I, I'll just add quickly that anybody from the community that has any documents that they believe are of historic value may add them to the collection. They, they will be doing that. Mm. For example, Dana's Trail of AIDS is, is certainly part of that connection. But mm. right now we need to fundraise because it's going to mm. take that to get the job done. Otherwise, we're back to square one, finding a new home. And again, chances are wherever we go, we're going to need to fundraise. So UCSF has launched a fundraising campaign and it has it's just gone live, but we're, we're right now beginning to really spread the word. Um, you can find the campaign on um, COTS website, cott1.org. As, uh, there's a link to the fundraising as well as the COT Facebook page. We'll also, we'll, we'll certainly be posting it multiple times up there. So this is, this is a huge undertaking. I mean, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of effort. Um, you know, it's a team effort mm -hmm. and it, it just, we have to spread mm -hmm. the word. So that's, that's where our focus is right now. And then we'll reassess after you know, as things get rolling and we get closer to our goal, we'll reassess Cut's, Cut's future um, mission. So I heard two calls to action. One, um, listeners, if you have documents in your possession that have some historical value, um, please contact Cot. Um, we'll give you all of that information in our program notes, um, and they can kind of um, evaluate that and see if that can't be preserved. And also, you're starting to fundraise for this. Um, and Kathy, tell me a little bit about um, what documents are included and just like the process, like why do we have to fundraise? Why is this, why is this uh, an endeavor that requires funding? Sure. Uh, it, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. It requires funding because okay. as I mentioned, there's 50 large boxes with documents and, and some of them, yeah. some of them are redundant, uh, but it's going to take, require professional archivists to actually go through the documents one by one, decide you know, which, which ones to keep, they are going to need to likely will need to find a, get a little more, um, background to these documents, because if you read these documents, mm -hmm. you may not know exactly what it's relating to. So it's going to require communicating right. with, with folks, you know, caught folks to, you know, give them some context for these documents. And so to go through 50 boxes of, of, paperwork just requires a lot of manpower 
and um, and mm. continued research. They have first what they will do is they will index. They will once they know what all of these papers are, they will index them. It will be a digital archive, and then that did that indexing will be on the use on the um, special Co archives and special collections website. Uh, with UCSF on, on their on their page, and then if anybody, then people can link to those specific documents. Now, not a hundred percent of those documents will be up there um, for people to see online right. because it's just too too much. So, if anybody wishes to mm. um, for free get a hard copy or you know have a document emailed, they may do that as well. So. It's just cool. a huge under undertaking. And then, yeah, the, the, you know, there's, there's overhead costs and costs to actually, we, we want to preserve mm -hmm. the papers because a lot of the papers are mm -hmm. computer printouts, which are fading in time. So that has to be physically mm -hmm. preserved as well. Oh, that's fantastic. And Dana and Kathy, tell me a little bit, um, what are some of the documents that are included? <laughs> Do we know? <laughs> thousands and thousands and oh. thousands, and they're, they're, they go, they date back all the way to um, what manufacturers were saying in the very beginning of the '80s. Um, and these are the kind of documents that Corey was collecting, and that I was collecting, and Michael Rosenberg was collecting, and um, it was, and that, and that's why I called it the trail of AIDS in the hemophilia community. Mm. Because when, um, when I had put all that I had together that Michael Rosenberg gave me, um, it, that's just 250 pages. It's just a small amount of the documents that are all out there. There's documents about lawsuits and, and, and many of these boxes of, are what Corey collected. And um, hmm. and that's why they found their home um, in in the university. And they they had uh, they were legal. They talked about the class action hmm. suit. They talked about uh, blood safety because that's again one of the biggest things that we were doing is blood safety. My again my job was kind of more legislative and blood safety. And Corey in, again involved with it. And um, and I think. These documents are going to be important because you'll you'll see exactly where our government went wrong and where the pharmaceutical companies went wrong. And as Kathy mm -hmm. said, we got to learn how to yeah. be vigilant and be able to make mm -hmm. sure these things don't happen again. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I I want to give just to go back a little bit and give credit to Corey because Corey. We made sure, Cott made sure that he was on the advisory committee of blood, uh, I mean, he was on BPAC, um, the Blood Products Advisory Committee, BPAC. Huh. And that was quite a feat to be able to get a consumer on that with all these doctors. And Corey did a wonderful job advocating for us on that. And we would all go to those meetings and, and come up with questions. And then I was the one who got on to the Advisory Committee of Blood Safety and Availability, which came out of the um, Institute of Medicine report. And so we had all these consumers or consumers that would always now have a seat on these government committees. And that's what we want to make sure still happens. And still we have happens. to have we have to have people who are trained and qualified to be able to do that. Um and I think these documents and history will help people understand that. Mm. Dana, do you think um, there'll be any pushback <laughs> from the powers that be? Um, like what powers to be? The government? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would assume there would be uh, some industries that would not, that would would prefer not to have these documents public. Um, well, it's too late. It's, they already are public through the Freedom Bravo. of Information Act, and they're they're already public, um, you know, through the government, and uh, they're there. You can go out and look for them, and you can find them. But now they're going to be as I think that this project is going to be is very important. It's going to be all categorized, and it will be mm. um, 
you know, put into some kind of logical order. And as I mm-hmm. said, the, the, there was so much that went on between 1992 and 1995 and during mm-hmm. those tumultuous years. Um, it's just like I have, um, I could show you uh, just to hold it up. I mean, just the, this is a timeline of what happened when and what was going on. And wow. this is why when they get that, together out there I, I would love to be able to bring some of this timeline and yeah. you know I'm kind of like a, a wannabe historian you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I didn't do it purposely it came by you know just the way it happened in life and yeah. wanted to make some sense of things well Dana Kathy, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing this um, to our listeners. I can um, absolutely confirm that our listenership is going to support this. Um, I will personally support it. Um, and we'd love to have you back to get kind of some updates um, throughout the year. Kathy, one more yeah, thing. Yeah, and I'd like to say in terms of um, industry and and current mm. concern, it, there's all yeah. there's different people in place now. So I, I do... Mm. You know, there's different people in place now, and and my hope would be that they could look at this with historic value as well. So, yes, one hundred percent. And, and Kathy, one more thing is, I guess if it's a fundraiser, where would people send their funds to? Their donation funds to support this? <laughs> there is a link on the COT website, c o t t one dot org, okay. and that first pa- on that first page, there will be a link to um, donate to the to the project, as well as on the Committee of 10,000 Facebook page, we will very shortly, by the time this airs, we will have posted um, the link as well. So, and it's tax, it's a tax deductible donation, of course. And Fantastic. Uh, We're going to have all that info on the program notes, y'all. Great. Right. right. Thank you so much, Dana and Kathy. I'm sure we'll have you back. Thank you for that history. And thank you for the work that you have done and are still continuing to do.